Yeah, we, we finished up uh, in the previous hour by looking at uh, uh, the application of two different sequencing criteria on our example. And we, we, we observed that uh, the difference was big, okay? It's, uh, it's not uh, uh, moving from an average tardiness of 24.2 into 8.6 is kind of really significant. So let's finish up and looking at this third criteria, which was sorting related to and what was it? Early. Due date, wasn't it? Yeah. So we kind of picked a job which it should be finished first by our given rule. So then I have to take one of these out, maybe both. Uh, we just need the, the final one on the top here. Of course, you can always construct an infinite amount of different ways of sorting a set of numbers. It was not infinite, but quite big, uh, if the number of jobs are at a reasonable size. So uh, you see there's kind of a great potential for doing things differently here. Okay, so if we look at the EDD, earliest due date, as our sorting criteria, then the sequence is 3, 5, 4, 2, 1. Okay. I'll just write this up. We have already perhaps forgotten the flow times. So we start with job 3. It has a flow, flow time of 31 and a due date of 31. So it ends up exactly with 0 on the tardiness. Uh, and then it's job number 5. It has a processing time of 2. So it's 31 plus 2, which is 33. And the due date of that one was 32, so we get a little bit of tardiness here. And then is job 4, it has a uh, processing time of 1, isn't it? 33 plus 1 is 34, and it had a due date of 33. So it's again 1 late, so we get a 1 here. You see immediately that we, we get uh, much more tardy jobs, however, the tardiness is quite small. Then is job 2. Uh, I don't remember anymore the flow time. Any, anyway, the answer here is 63 and the due date was 45, so there is a tardiness of 18 in this case. And the final one, job one, ends up with 74. Note that the make span is constant. You see that it's the same every, every time. And the due date was 61, so it's a tardiness of 13. So if you add together here the flow times, you get 235 here and 33 here. And then you can kind of make a table where you look at these three sorting criteria, F, C, F, S, or SPT, shortest processing time rule, and earliest due date sorting, and put up the average flow time, the average tardiness, and the number of tardy jobs, and make a table here, and compare the results. Uh, there was 53.6, the longest mean flow time, uh, using the fairness criteria, so to speak. It was 27 in the shortest processing time, it was 47 in the earliest due date. The average tardiness was 24 here. And if you look at the average tardiness here, 33 divided by 5, it's slightly above 6 which actually is smaller than this one. So the average tardiness comes nice out here. So this was 8.6, this was 6.6. 3, 1, 4. Of course, what we typically would do then would be to minimize in each of these columns. Look for the sorting criteria, which has the smallest mean flow time, which is the shortest processing rule. The smallest average tardiness turns out to be the earliest due date rule while the smallest number of tardy jobs is here. So we see here that uh, the classical first come first serve principle is perhaps not very efficient. On the other hand, it's very fair. Okay? These other criteria are typically unfair in a lot of situations, but they are kind of efficient. And it seems perhaps that the shortest processing rule criteria seems to be fairly robust even though the earliest due date has some 
potential when it comes to average tardiness, but it has a tendency to produce a larger number of tardy jobs, at least if we should take this example as a little bit more than an example. But the point here is really not to generalize, and the problem here is that it's we can make some statements when we look at very simple problems, like a single machine problem we have here, then it's possible to derive a lot of theory. And then you can actually prove that the shortest processing time rule criteria produces the smallest mean flow time. So that is actually the optimal solution to that problem. But I don't see much point in going into details about these matters here, because you can construct a whole theory here with a lot of complex mathematics. And I think it's more important to, to try to take this problem and demonstrate a mixed integer programming model for you, which you can kind of see how we do this when we really want to, to solve practically relevant problems. Because this theory in between coming after the, these parts of the book is kind of very limited when it comes to what kind of problems it can attack. Okay. But of course, there is some learning here. If you want to do something efficient, you should perhaps not think about fairness. Maybe that's not the most efficient way of doing things. Of course, if the first come, first serve sequence also is the same as, as, uh, as the processing time, then of course it's no problem. In that case, it would run nicely. But you see here, by, by just doing Slight changes in the sequence we look at, we get very different results. And that is, of course, the whole kind of underlying idea behind scheduling as a kind of optimization topic in logistics. And, uh, and uh, if you think about a lot of common situations, they can be thought of as scheduling problems. Let's think about a big airport, okay? There's a lot of airplanes circling around this airport, okay? They are scheduled to land, they have their due dates. That's the timetable, isn't it, for the planes? And of course, in this tower in the airport, they make decisions on which plane is next to go down. So they actually make a sequence. Okay? And depending on where they are, we have the process time, the flight time from their location into the airport, so we can find the processing times, and we have the due dates, due dates due to the due to the routes or the or the timetables. But if you think about that situation, it's even more complex, isn't it? Because planes, they are, have, are different sized. So there are small planes with few passengers, and there are big planes with many passengers. So then there's a new dimension coming in here, the passenger dimension. So of course, if, we, if there is a very small plane, which has a very short processing time, meaning flight time to the airport, as well as uh, uh, a due date which uh, makes it sensible to kind of put it in. If that has the consequence that a very big plane will have to wait a lot, then of course you, you make a lot of passengers tardy. Okay? And that is by itself something which is bad. So then it's a question on how, kind of how to maybe average number of passenger tardiness, for instance, not job tardiness. So you see, just by looking at a very kind of simple, practical situation, you can kind of see that it resembles scheduling. Actually, it is scheduling, but it imposes some even more complexity on how to do this. I assume you all have been kind of sitting in planes, circling our big towns at some point in time and uh, become slightly annoyed. Of course, this is not a big problem. As long as you come down with, with your life, then uh, <laughs> at least from my point of view, I'm happy. So I don't uh, bother so much about these extra hours. But it's kind of obvious that uh, if there's a very big plane, you should perhaps take down bef that one before a small plane, even though it's perhaps not fair. On the other hand, making all these passengers tardy, as opposed to two passengers tardy in this small plane, is perhaps not fair either. Okay, Both planes are scheduled to land at a certain point in time. So the fairness kind of problem becomes a little bit more complex in those situations. There's a lot of other situations in the real world which is not necessarily in this machine job way of thinking. If you think about um, oil fields, for instance, you probably know that there is a lot of oil fields who have been kind of found, which are not yet developed. 
typically due to the fact that the, the price cost ratio is too low or you typically that is the case okay and uh, it could be a, a point of kind of developing new technology to make it cheaper so you could develop it and if you make this kind of breakthrough of course there could be kind of a whole list of potential oil field to, to build out and then you perhaps could really understand that it could be a kind of sequencing problem which field should be developed first what is the consequence of taking one field in front of another one should you take the big one before the small one this depends on your transport possibilities do you have a pipeline pipeline around and those, all that those kind of things okay so you see scheduling is not kind of limited only to this machine park in a factory but as we kind of said it we kind of we kind of describe logistics as kind of strategic levels you strategic planning less strategic very operational okay i think that's a good way to think because it's, it's easier to to manage but um, scheduling oil fields is obviously not the operational thing you do it over many years typically so so it, it takes a lot of time okay okay we will uh, maybe talk a little bit about uh, maybe so much not so much about sequencing when we come to the event part but we look at similar type of problems okay peaking event locations for instance which is referred to as location theory in logistics there is a certain chapter in the book if you would, if you like you can read it but we will return more explicitly to it when we move into the event part okay so what i intend to do now is to pick a job shop example okay i picked that from another textbook than the one we have at hand and the reason was perhaps that it was the examples in the book was perhaps not very much as i like them so i picked another one okay uh, this example is copied and put into front end so uh, i will show it you to it where it is okay so now we are moving into this part here, okay? A mixed integer programming model for a job shop problem. Just to demonstrate kind of how we, how we can do it. So, uh, if you look, uh, sorry about this, if you look at uh, the added material here, uh, there is a file called job shop MIP model PDF. So if you open that one, this example is completely described but I will spend a little time the rest of this hour I think to kind of run quickly through it how it how it works logically okay so in this case we have defined a job shop okay there are three jobs there are four machines there are different sequences on each of the machine you see here that uh, this product a or job a as we would like to call it you go through machine one, machine three, and machine four. Product B or job B, if you if you prefer, prefer to, to keep this job way of speaking, starts and machine one, moves into two, and then jumps to four. While the final product or the final job is only using two of the machines, machine two and machine three. And we have the processing times given here as parameters. So A1 is the processing time for job A in machine 1 A3 is the processing time for job A in machine 3 and so on okay now what we're aiming to do now is to try to find a mathematical formulation of this problem and then we need to kind of look seriously into the logic here and it's not obvious what kind of variables we should define so let me help you a little by starting okay uh, the variable definition here is, is kind of a key okay and it turns out that if you define the following type of variable x a j this is a continuous variable okay it can take any kind of value and it's the time point when processing processing means kind of starting to execute this job then processing of 
job A starts on machine J. Okay, so there are, we have this, this subscript now, it kind of varies between the machines, but we typically explicitly define for each of the jobs. So we need an XBJ here as well as an XCJ, okay? They're kind of the same variable as this one. So it could be B or C under here, okay? So we, we kind of define three variable sets now, one for each of the jobs, and they kind of range, of course, on each of the machines. So given this variable definition, it's relatively straightforward to accept that I must have constraints of the, this type. X, A1, that is the time point when the processing of job A starts on machine 1, okay? It's the starting point here for job A. Now job A takes A1 time units. So if I add A1 time units to this one, then this time point must be smaller than or equal to the start of the next job in the sequence, which is this one, isn't it? X, A, 3. Do you see this? It should be fairly easy, okay? I cannot start to process my job A on this machine until I've started and finished it there. Okay, that's the logic in this constraint or equation. We tend to call these precedence relations. So a precedence relation says something about the underlying logic on how I can sequence. This is my definition of the structure, the recipe, if you like. I have to stick to my recipe, okay? I cannot start processing this job at this machine before it has been finished processing on the machine in front. Of course, the same is here then, isn't it? So I have to add more of these constraints, obviously. There must be something like this, x a3 plus the processing time on machine 3 must finish up before I can start on machine 4. Let's call, put some numbers here, A1, A2. And then we kind of finish what we need for job A, didn't we? You have to make certain that this flows through in a logically correct manner. And then we have to have two similar kind of constraints for job or product B, don't we? X, B1 plus B1 must be smaller than or equal to the starting point of X, B2. Let's call that on B1. And we need X, B2 plus B2. Now we are here. Must be smaller than the starting point in machine 4. B4. This is referred to in my notes as B2. And then finally we have to put one of these constraints on the final job, or product C. There's only one needed there, okay? X C2 plus C2 should be smaller than or equal than X C3. And we call this one C1. Now this takes care of a part of the total logic. It secures that we cannot start processing a job on a machine after in the sequence, before it's finished before. But these do not take care of the fact that we could start with two jobs on a single machine, which are not allowed here, okay? We, we cannot pro process two jobs on the same machine at the same time. So we have to put some logic which avoids this, OK? 
Okay? Let's look at that. This is referred to as non-interference constraints. We cannot interfere in a machine. We cannot put two or three drops into the same machine. We have to do one, finish that one, then we can put another one into it. This only takes care of the sequence here. We, we do not kind of look together here. So we can put this and this job in at the same time. We cannot allow that. So we have to construct logic which avoids that. As I said, this is referred to as non-interference constraints. If you look at machine one here, for instance, you see that job A should enter machine one, and job B should also enter machine one. So either must job A come before job B on machine one, or vice versa, okay? Because job C is not a part of it. Do you see? So either, either it must be like this, x A1 plus A1, must be smaller than or equal to xb1. This means that job A starts first on machine A, or alternatively, the other way around, xb1 plus b1 must be smaller than or equal to xa1. Okay? So either it must be like this, or it must be like this. It can't be like this at the same time. <coughs> In order to fix this, we have to introduce a binary variable. Okay, that is the, the trick here. Okay. What if we look at the following? What if we look at oh let's look at x a one plus a one less than or equal to x b1. This is just a copy of the first relation here, and then we add a big M here. Now if this M is present, then we kill this logic, don't we? Because no matter what value this one has, the total right-hand side value would be a very big number. Just meaning that as, as long as you, you put this number as big as it's outside the horizon here, it wouldn't actually have any effect on what you do here. So having a, a M which is working here would make this relation inactive. See, then it doesn't really work. It doesn't matter. But an M which is not there would make it active. And that's really what we would like to have here, okay? They cannot be active at the same time. Either one is active or the other one. And the trick then is the following. Now, what we can do then is that to introduce this binary variable, let's call it uh, delta 1 for instance, delta 1, and we couple it to these two, these part here. Let me just write down the relations, okay, so we look at it. x a1 plus a1, and now I just take this one and move it to the left hand side, so I subtract x b1, and it should be smaller than or equal to the following construct, m times delta 1. And then I look at this one, and I write it like this, xb1 plus b1 minus xa1. Again, using the same structure, putting that on the left-hand side, should be smaller than or equal to m times 1 minus delta 1. Okay. Now you probably see that the logic works here, okay? If delta 1 is 1, in that case, this one is zero. Then we're back to this constraint. But then delta 1 is 1, and then there's a big M, so this one is taken out. It's inactive. So if delta 1 is 1, this one is active. 
If delta 1 is 0, then there is 0 there, then in that case this one is active, the other one is not active, because then a 0, we have the big M on that one. So we cannot move the big M between the two constraints to produce our logic. Of course, this is not so easy to come by if you didn't know it, okay? So there is some tricks to this, doing this kind of stuff. Okay, there will be more than these two constraints here to make this work, doesn't it? Because there is something that could happen on machine 2 here. Product B could enter here and here. So we have to put a pair of constraints on this one, as well as on this one, and on these two, okay? So there will be two more here, two more here, and two more here. We started out here now, okay? So all cases where it's possible for jobs to kind of enter the same machine at the same time, we have to uh, impose this logic. So there will be two plus six more of these relations, exactly of the same structure. Do we need to write them down? They are of course in the example here. If you just move down here, you see that there are a number that's slightly different uh, than I do it here. And you see they come here, okay? This is what we have been discussing so far. And they are added six more of them, okay? To account for the, the logical facts that I talked about. That there's There are more than the first machine that could have a collision, okay? We can have a collision here, here we can have a collision, there we can have a collision, and there. And with two each, two times three is six. We have to add six to the original two, producing a total of eight of these so-called non-interference constraints. Uh, yeah, I took out, there was a, a certain number, a little bit, yeah, I took out this other part. Okay. So, then what's left? The objective, okay? We, kind of, we have to have uh, all our variables x, a, b, c, j, they must all be positive. We can't kind of start the jobs at the negative time point, that would be cheating. And we have to add first this set of precedence constraints, or precedence relations, and non-interference constraints. But we're still missing the objective, aren't we? And, as I said, when we actually move from a single machine situation into a jobs job situation, it's, uh, it opens up for actually looking at different make spans. So now we can kind of look at minimizing make span, which is a typical objective in this situation. So we would like to find the schedule or the sequence here, which makes your system run as fast as possible. Because if you do that, then you can start it again and produce another batch, okay? So so that, that seems like a, a rel relatively reasonable uh, objective to look at. Okay. Okay, we would like... Oh, I should take this out. Unfortunately, that is not straightforward either. But uh, we can handle it, I think. So, our objective, we choose it to be minimizing make, make span. We're actually performing our production as fast as possible. That's another way of saying that. Now, the make span is the same as finishing. the last job on <coughs> the last machine. Okay. So the make span is the job which finishes last on this machine, on this machine, or on this machine. Mm -mm. Now, job A finishes in 
it starts at x a four limited. It starts here and have to spend a slight amount of time here of a four. So it finishes after this expression. Okay, this is the variable, this is a number. Job B finishes at x b4 plus b4 while job c finishes at x c3 plus c3 and it's the biggest of these three numbers which defines our make span isn't it if this job stops at 10 this job stops at 11 and this job stops at 10 of course it's this one which defines the actual make span when are we actually finished so we see we, we run into a slight problem here okay our objective would be to maximize this number or uh, picking among these numbers the biggest one okay Of course, these are functions, okay? And they, they behave as we did previously, a linear function. So, this is the kind of thing where we have three straight lines, something like this. So, we should end up with this as the result. But unfortunately, it is nonlinear. Luckily, it is piecewise linear, and that opens up for some tricks. So, if it had been a smooth curve, that would be a bit more tricky. But as long as it's kind of consisting of piecewise linear parts, then in most cases we can reformulate it by a trick as linear. And coming up with this trick by yourself is perhaps too much to ask. It both needs a lot of experience as well as a good part of creativity. Okay? So let me show you what it is. It turns out that if we introduce a new variable, we introduce a new, should we say, help variable. Can okay, you help variable? And we call it just small set. Okay? Let me write three constraints. Set larger than or equal to x a4 plus a4. Set larger than or equal to x b4 plus b4. Set larger than or equal to x c3 plus c3. So I introduce a help variable here and I, I put that together with these expressions in this form. Now let's look at an example. Now suppose this expression has the value of 10, this expression has the value of 9, and the final one has the value of 15. Okay. Then it says here that z should be larger than or equal to 10, it should also be larger than or equal to 9, and finally it should be larger than or equal to 15. What is the value of z now? It must be this one which works, isn't it? If it's larger than 10, then it could be 15. Larger than 9, still 15. So the biggest one of these three are now picked by this logical structure. Can you see that? So if I co combine this with adding a minim minimal set, finding the smallest set which picks the largest one of this one, this is actually what I would like, isn't it? I want to minimize set which is the maximum or something. So I'm actually doing a min-max operation here, if you like. So putting up the same variable as larger than a set of numbers, of course it would pick the largest number. And then I can add min set as my objective, adding these constraints, and I have converted my nonlinear structure into a linear structure. Because these are linear constraints, my objective has a single variable, of course, a linear. So I I don't need to use this object, you know, I can use this one instead, as long as I put this into the model. Of course, this is a trick, okay, to so-called non-linear to linear trick, I would say. We try to 
we linearize the model by using these kind of tricks. If you recall, early in this course when we talked about linear regression, we discussed the option of using an absolute value instead of a square root in our objective. If we have used an absolute value, then we'd have to use this kind of method. Then we would have to use linear programming, typically with binary variables, to kind of keep track on which part of this absolute value you're on. So you can do it. Unfortunately, it becomes kind of tedious and it takes much more time than computing these nice formulas we did when we choose the square root, uh, sorry, the square version of the, of the sum of errors. So these mathematical programming methods, they open up for a kind of much larger uh, space of doing everything you like, basically. Unfortunately, as I said, they tend to be time-consuming when you solve the problems. But the point now is that now we have the means, we have our formulation. So as long as we put some numbers now into these A's and B's and C's, you can put these into lingo, can't we? And I have done so. So let's have a final look at the example, what it looks like. And you can test and run it if you like. There is uh, something called jobshop.lg4 here, which is this model with numbers on the A's and the B's. I don't remember if the example contains numbers. Let's let me see. Yeah, I can write it uh, up for you on the board. So for the lingo model. I use A1 equal to 10, A3 equal to 5, A4 equal to 7, B1 equal to 6, B2 equal to 6, B4 equal to 6. So all the Bs have the same processing time, while C2 is 1 and C3 is 30. So these are the kind of data you need to add when you put the model into Lingo. So let's have a look at what it looks like. It was this one. I need to save it, I think. Same as on desktop, same. Uh, let me start Lingo. Mm, then I have to go here, I think, and go to computer, which is there, then I have to go to M, and there is something called Lingo here, and there it is. And this one. And I open the file, which I don't want it on the desktop. It's here. Ah, this was not the right file. Sorry, wrong file. It was not a plot site I wanted, it was job shop. Silly me. Sorry about this. It's this one. Save as save. Now see this. This was not such a big model. If you remember, there were kind of eight of these. Uh, constraints here where you introduce this binary variable and we use the same bar binary variable in, in two and two of them. So we need four binary variables. I call them D1 up to D4 and you see the structure here where the numbers is added. Here is the these uh, precedence constraints, it's the non-interference constraints here and you have this construct on the top where you have set as the objective and set should be smaller than or equal to to uh, the, the, the expressions we wrote on the board. So this is a straight copy of what we wrote, wrote here in full. Okay, you see it's much smaller than the models we have seen so far. So let's try and solve it. Yeah. 
it produces a solution. Again, too fast, of course. There is no observable <laughs> time here. But uh, again, we have kind of. If you make this model a little bit bigger, adding, let's say, uh, 10 machines and 10 jobs, then it could take hours. Okay. It could actually take years just by that change. Believe me, I'm not lying now. Okay. So, so this is really true. Okay. The problem is that we can't do this on these D movers, and then you have to use some other tools, and those other tools, they. Uh, we will spend too much time in learning them, okay? So we, I don't bother with it. Of course, we get the solution out here now. We find uh, that uh, XC3 starts first in. Uh, no, XC2 starts first in time. Time zero, and then it seems like it's XC3 starts in one. And the next one is XA1 in 6, and XB2 in 6, and it, yeah, XB1 as well. XB1 and XC2 starts first here. You can see we can start them at the same time due to them. There are, there are two machines here that kind of are in parallel, okay? You can start one in the first machine and one in the other one. That's possible, of course. Yeah, okay. That was basically the first half of this course. Now we have kind of gone through the parts I found relevant enough. A few words finally perhaps about what we haven't talked about. Um, uh, we did discuss some uncertainty related to the newspaper problem yesterday. We did not discuss the classical uncertain version of the EOQ formula. But uh, it's very time consuming and uh, fairly complex, so I skipped that, okay? We have spent some time discuss discussing binary variables. We have said a little bit about the complexity which is introduced. Um, there is some subjects we have not discussed at all. We have not discussed uh, location picking, which we shall discuss when we move into the second part. We have said very little about facility location and which is kind of constructing this. How many machines should you have? Uh, where should it be? Should you have inventory? Where should your inventory be? And that kind of stuff. Kind of doing the investment part of logistics. How to prepare a logistics system. What should it look like? Uh, as you probably know, today there is a lot of complexities here. Okay, uh, A modern car doesn't have a single producer, does it? It has a lot of producers. Somebody produces the engine, others produces the spark plugs, and so on. And even it's such that these subparts have another net of producers. So it's a very complex supply chain, as we say. And there is a certain part of logistics which deals with supply chain, or it's often uh, named supply chain management. Uh, but it's a part of logistics which um, kind of relies on a different methodical framework than we do here. You don't use typically mathematical programming, you typically don't use mathematical methods at all, so it's more like a kind of learning part. If you're interested, there are certain courses here on the school which you can take, which kind of discusses the concepts of supply chain management in that framework. Don't misunderstand me, I don't say that it's not important. And of course in events, knowing something about who to comp who to cooperate with, who to compete with, is of course always important. The, conse uh, the consequences on choosing that as a competitor versus that as a cooperator, of course that is extremely important. Uh, you probably know that if you look into the sports scene, there's a, a fairly minimal amount of cooperation. There is a little bit between certain clubs, for instance Molde here and the local in town in uh, north town in Kristiansund, there is a kind of cooperation between the two teams, but there must be a certain distance between the teams when it comes to performance before this kind of cooperation is allowed. When, it's, when it comes to cooperating in a kind of classical industrial supply chain, almost everything is allowed. Okay, you can you can buy up your uh, subcontractor, you can cooperate with him, or you can do a kind of mix of that. You can outsource, you can insource. There's a lot of options here. Okay. And this is the kind of topics you will discuss if you kind of enter a course in supply chain management, some central topics. But uh, this course is not focusing on these parts, okay? So we kind of focus more on the mathematical side here. 
trying to learn you what I at least think is harder to learn than uh, these other stuff, which is, in my opinion, at least you can read it yourself, right? Reasonable amount of understanding. But it's always harder to read these stuff yourself unless you're kind of very oriented in this direction. So, so this is why I've chosen the way I've chosen. But we, we will hopefully see. There is a little chapter here on supply chain management, if I'm not forgetting completely. Let's see. Yeah, we will talk about uh, event forecasting, focusing on a little different way of thinking than we did in classical forecasting. Talk a little bit about events and inventory management, event production, event supply chains. Yeah, there is some talks about event supply chains. A little bit about event transportation. Finalizing with uh, facility location, yeah, how to locate your events. Okay. I, I think we stop there for today, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So, do you have any questions? Not now. Not yet? <laughs> Maybe next week. Okay, then we start with this other book, and uh, have a nice weekend, a uh, nice Cheers. rest of the week, and uh, Today I think Champions League starts, doesn't it? Yeah. So, if we get bored, we can look at Copenhagen against Juventus today, I think. <laughs>